everybody. This is Daylon James and Arun Sharma. Welcome back to the Stem Cell Podcast, where we culture knowledge and stem cell research by talking to some of the brightest minds in the field. The Stem Cell Podcast is brought to you by Stem Cell Technologies, a global biotechnology company supporting life science research and fostering communication and collaboration in science. Today, we're bringing you a very special episode straight from the ISSCR 2022 annual meeting in San Francisco, which took place from June 15th to the 18th. It was a great meeting, and we had the pleasure of meeting and discussing science with researchers from all over the world. Today, we'll be bringing you some of those conversations as we hear from delegates about their thoughts on the meeting and some of the biggest opportunities and challenges in stem cell research. But before we jump into things. Organoids, we know all about them. They're physiologically relevant tools for studying human tissues. Share your thoughts on using organoids in research by taking a 15 minute survey from Stem Cell Technologies. Visit www.stemcell.com slash organoid dash quiz to share your current needs and challenges. All right, let's get right into it. As you all know, the recent ISSCR annual meeting was the first to be in person since 2019. Back in March, we had ISSCR CEO Keith Alm, President Melissa Little, and Vice President Amanda Clark on an episode where they shared what to look forward to at the meeting. But we wanted to hear what those attending the meeting were most excited about with it being back in person. Here's what some of the attendees had to say. My name is Abhinil Mori. I'm an intern at Arvinus. Uh, I'm currently getting my master's degree from Penn State. Um, once I'm done with my internship, I get to graduate. This is actually my first conference in person, so okay. it's very exciting for me to be here. Um, I did attend some conferences back when I was in Penn State, um, but they were all virtual because I came here in the midst of COVID. And it's really uh, exciting to be here in person because you get to see all the speakers live. You got to interact with them. And I feel overall, it's just a more of a wholesome experience being in a person, like an in-person conference. Hi, my name is Chloe and I'm a postdoc in Leonard Zahn's lab at Boston Children's Hospital uh, in Boston. And I'm originally from France. Yeah, I mean, for me, it's my first conference back in three years. So that was just really excited. Also just uh, traveling to a new place where there's not only a new city to explore, but also new people to meet and also being face to face. I'm really always loving the post sessions at conferences. And I think this is where the mixing and sharing ideas and brainstorming happens. So honestly, the post sessions is almost what I'm most excited about, but also seeing a big crowd gather like this for the first time in three years. I haven't seen a group like this in three years. So yeah. it's really, that was really exciting, exciting to me. Hi, my name is Davila Arleti. I'm a postdoctoral fellow at Paul Burge Lab at Northwestern University. And I'm a professional cell culture media mixer. <laughs> <laughs> seeing people and making new connections, especially because like having virtual is interesting to see the research, how it's going on. But one of the biggest advantages of having the meeting is like not only seeing the faces, but having the impromptu conversations that you're like waiting for a coffee and see someone that you think like, oh, the research was amazing, the person presented. And you can just go and like tell the person. And with these like spread a conversation that becomes like a 15 minutes conversation, new project ideas that like can be a future collaboration if you're from different institutions or something like even more fruitful, like a grant if you're the same institution. So that is the biggest advantage of having like in person again. Hi, I'm Debbie and I'm a staff researcher at Stanford University. I think the most exciting thing is this is like an international family reunion, academic family reunion. Um, it's been really lovely meeting friends from Europe, from the US, collaborators. Uh, it's really nice to finally meet people and not talk to Zoom. <laughs> My name is Emily Ballard. I'm a grad student over at UT Southwestern in Dallas, Texas. Uh, so I just finished my third year over in June Wu's lab. So he's the, the interspecies chimera guy. Um, in general, just kind of meeting everyone and seeing these, these names that I've only seen on the author's list of papers, actually getting to talk to them in person. Uh, some of them came to my poster the other night and just kind of networking and getting a broader idea of the field in general. My name is Ishita Jain. I'm a final year PhD student at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Well, <laughs> this is my first time attending it. So, I mean, I'm just happy that it 
it's there and then I, I got to know about it that it exists yeah. um love the city here love the conference so far i think this is the first time where i don't have to think hard about where i want to go or what talk i want to attend it's mm. like everything's so relevant um i've never had such a good fit for a conference to my work so yeah. it's been amazing yeah hi i'm lauren jennings and i'm a graduate student at mayo clinic yeah, so I'm a second year graduate student, so I'm new to the field. And so I've done a lot of reading during the first two years of doing a lot of online grad school and seeing names of people, but it's been really exciting to be here in person. And now I have faces to names. I'm seeing people give talks and I'm like, I read that paper and I know who you are and connecting with people in my field and stuff has been the most exciting part and really feeling like I'm uh, someone who can contribute to the field and like entering into you know, the SimSol space. Hi guys, my name is Liam Taylor. I'm the CEO of Axel Biosciences based in Cambridge in the UK and another site in Roslyn in Edinburgh. I think it has to be the personal interaction, you know, those relationships that I think we've been missing that, that eye to eye, belly to belly uh, interaction. Um, you know, teams work so well to a degree, but you can't beat that personal one to one getting out there, touching some of the cool technology that's out there on some of these exhibitors uh, stands, uh, you know, catching up with old colleagues and peers and you know going for going for a quiet libation afterwards as well as always <laughs> of, of something that we all enjoy. I'm Kiwi Florido. I am a third year PhD student in the lab of Lee Rubin at Harvard University and I am also co-mentored by Christopher Sorozek at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. I think I'm most excited about just meeting colleagues from all over the world again in person and connecting um, and feeling the connection and being able to catch up, um, you know, in different parts of the meetings and whatnot and going to actual talks together while being able to chat about certain aspects of talks um, in person. I think that really, that, that aspect is very different from, you know, chatting with someone online. Um, it seems very impersonal um, to me. My name is Peter Dang. I'm a product manager over at Syntico, automated cell editing platform out of Redwood City. I'm going to repeat what many people have said during this meeting in that it's really fantastic to be, you know, in person talking to researchers again. The last couple of years of virtual meetings, while it's been a necessary evil, maybe evil is not the right term, but, you know, actually that really, I think, made accessibility a big thing. So we've been able to talk to people across the world when you know, maybe talking to researchers out in Asia or Europe was not really feasible. So I think the last few years has been really fantastic in that regard. But, you know, there's something magnetic about walking through these big crowds and posters and talking to people about their research and like pointing at figure four, hey, hey explain to me what's going on here, um, what's going on and actually having that in-person rapport that you can't capture virtually. So, you know, the, the last couple of years of this sort of um, thankfully temporary hiatus of not being in person going back in person's fantastic and I think a lot of researchers are really excited to come back out and talk network and you know move forward my name is uh, Yofi Weil I'm a PhD student at UC Davis yeah I feel like the real magic happens behind the scenes meeting people and kind of getting to know people behind the scenes getting you know just mingling with people during like the foods and the coffee that's kind of the most exciting and like you know, fulfilling moments for me, really. I've met this group from London, a bunch of uh, awesome chaps who just like do the same research that I do. And I'm kind of in a niche field doing amniotic fluid research. And so being able to connect over our research from someone who's like, you know, miles and miles away from, from where I'm at was probably the, the best moment for me so far. Um, so I just love the kind of, you don't really get that in a Zoom setting. You don't really get the behind the scenes kind of magic mingling moments that you get at like an in-person conference. All right, definitely some great answers from researchers at the conference. What about you, Arun? What were you most excited about after two years of going virtual? Yeah, well, I'll first of all, just reiterate what everyone has said. It's just really great to see faces. You know, there's been people that I've met over the last couple of years, even the various guests that we've had on the show that I've never had the chance to actually meet one-on-one -on -one in person and say what you want. It's human beings, in my opinion, are social creatures. We got to meet each other face-to-face -face and, you know, have these kind of organic conversation. So the social part of it was definitely the, the biggest thing for me. And also the other thing was getting to meet everybody who has listened to the show you know, it's, I joined the show back in 2019. And the first time we actually got to meet each other day on was at the last 
ISSCR in person, which was in LA in 2019. And since then, you know, it's been a great adventure. And, you know, the fact that a lot of people have been listening to what we've been able to say and have enjoyed our coverage of the science, even during the pandemic, um, and people have showed their appreciation, that's, it's been very heartwarming, really, in a lot of ways. Yes, I second that. Uh, it was great to see you again, only for the second time in person, Arun, which is pretty nuts considering <laughs> our history over the last three years. And uh, yeah, just talking to some of the listeners, what a highlight for me. I, they were, you know, it was a bit overwhelming for me at times, but I really appreciated their appreciating us. And I just like to say directly to all of you guys that we spoke to, we really appreciate you listening and hope you're enjoying the show and hope we can keep it going. As expected, there was a lot of great research presented throughout the meeting. If you missed out and want to hear about some of the highlights, don't forget to check out our daily ISSCR roundup episodes where we summarize some of our favorite research presented throughout the meeting. But we also wanted to hear about the research that delegates were talking about throughout the meeting. Here's what some of them had to say. Hi, my name is Chloe. So actually, that was just a talk a couple hours ago. Uh, I work on medvedic stem cell and their niche. And so I'm really into uh, going further than what the stem cell is actually doing, but what actually supports its function and its role. And it was just a talk from a wonderful woman called Ra Raquel, I believe, mm -hmm. and uh, from Ellen Fuchs lab. And she talked about uh, how lymphatic vessel impact uh, intestinal stem cells and organoid. And I'm really into that dialogue between the niche and the stem cells, not only in healthy situations, but also in disease. And I thought that was beautiful to see something kind of along the same line of my research, but also in another system. Mm. And I think that's really inspiring always. And I think that's what ISSCR does so well is that stem cells, the core of it, but there's of course, so many different types of things you can uh, look into uh, about stem cells and their environment. And even though I work on blood, I have so much to learn about all the other systems out there. So that talk to me was very inspiring. Like I really liked it because it was completely different, but also very similar. So I really like that. I probably need to say that Len's talk was the best. Otherwise, I might get in trouble when I get back to Boston. So that was really good. Hi, my name is Davila Orleti. Uh, two are different things. For example, yesterday, uh, two were interesting talks about the CAR T cell therapy. Mm -hmm. So it was a topic that I saw with my PhD friends. Like when I was doing my PhD, I had PhD friends from other labs who were working on that and seeing how the field has progressed in the past like five years. And it's something that I was like kind of detached besides their research. And now it's like ISSCR. It's not only like specific cancer conferences and how this can also be translated to other applications for cell therapy. So like you're, if you're thinking about engineering cell surfaces, this can be used for engineering like cellular therapies, for example, regenerative therapies for the heart or for other types of tissues that it can use a similar approach of like tagging the cells or like engineering the cells mm -hmm. with some specific tags that can deliver the things better. So that was one of the most interesting things. Hi, I'm Debbie. Um, I think my f there's so many good research going on, but if I had to pick somebody to highlight, it would be Professor Christine Mumry. I really like the 5,000 cell micro tissues that she's making. And uh, I just love how in her talk, she highlighted this simple model that could be applied to so many new different applications, not just for disease modeling, but for really probing questions about you know, developmental diseases, genetic diseases. Um, I thought that was a very simple but elegant, elegant approach. My name is Emily Ballard. So there's been a lot of really good talks already so far. Um, the talk by Austin Smith was pretty cool. That yeah. was a good one. Um, there was also the the whole kind of controversy with the blastoids. It's been really exciting to be a part of because I know my lab was a part of that. And it was interesting to see both the perspective of the eye blastoids and then a bit of the rebuttal to that. And I think one of my favorites as well has been the, the axioid or somatoid project, mm -hmm. because it's been so cool seeing not just the, the oscillation, but an actual model of these aggregates budding off somite and thinking of all the, the applications of this type of thing for research in the future. Hi, my name is Erika Guerrero. I'm from Panama. I work at the Gorgas Memorial Lab for Health Research in Panama. So I saw this talk about uh, therapeutic CAR T cells for cancer, which is a topic that is innovative um, at the moment, but this one in particular was uh, impressive to me because you could see the PET scan uh, from mm. patients that they started with patients that have tried everything. And when you see the, the PET scan, it's like all filled with metastasis. Mm. And then the 60 days after the treatment, 
you could see the pet scan is cleared. And I don't think I've ever seen something that impressive in 60 days. And the actually approach of what they did is also, I found it very uh, important and, and innovative because they are trying to make these CAR T cells therapeutic more specific for the cancer cells because um, earlier it's, it's effective, but it's not as specific. Mm -hmm. So I think this is one step forward. My name is Ishita Jain, uh, one of the plenary sessions, um, a professor at UCLA that developed this new CAR T cell with um, dual targeting CD19 and CD20. Mm. The name slipping my in from my head, but yeah. um, that research gave me goosebumps. Like she showed clinical data and how it worked um, in almost all the patients. Mm. And those patients had actually gone through um, multiple treatment before that had not worked for them and this thing worked it was it's super inspiring hi i'm nazia rasiwala and i am a master's student at the university of western ontario so my favorite talk so far has been uh dr leonard zahn's talk about cl clonal hematopoiesis and uh how macrophages groom hematopoietic stem cells and Got some really cool videos with the uh, fluorescent live cell imaging in zebrafish. So, yeah, that was my favorite part so far. My name's Liam Taylor. Look, I, I, memorable, I think probably more practical for me. And it's, yeah. it's Joseph Wu's presentation earlier today. Uh, we play a lot in the cardiomyocytes area from an iPSC application perspective. And, you know, we've just had our SIPA validated. So it was really great to see the you know the beginning of that thought process from the guy who laid it all out and yeah. put the three pieces of technologies together and enabled that to happen so for, for us and certainly for me personally that was the antithesis i think for the show for me today i'm kiwi florido i think for me there was one talk about um just using omics in general to understand um like a uh, neonatal um, development in humans. And that sort of like, that's what I look forward to in ICCR, like hearing more and more about these um, human or patient samples and how they're being used to gain a better understanding um, of human development overall and disease, right? Um, meanwhile, the rest of us, obviously, like we're, we're only able to use, you know, our very humbling um, mouse models, um, which is obviously really useful, but, um, just the possibility of how these new tools and development um, are able to shape our, you know, my science and other people's science is like really exciting. My name's Peter Dang. Oh man, there's been some, I think the first day, so this past Wednesday was really exciting. There are a couple fantastic talks in terms of this more AI driven research. I think that much like what we've seen within tech, big data is so incredibly valuable for how we move forward, especially within the stem cell field where there's so many different parameters and metrics that are moving at the same time. How do we better capture and understand that? And some of the work that people are describing in terms of developing these neural networks um, to describe, can you actually look at a cell based off of cell morphology from these high content imagers, look at it, let them expand out and can just base off of the morphology are you able to train uh, programs to actually determine and predict the fate of these cells? So there are really a couple of fantastic talks this Wednesday that discussed it. And I think that, you know, as we learn more and more about what's, what's impacting how a cell goes, are our media conditions not necessarily the ideal situation for these cells that are causing them to potentially spontaneously differentiate? I mean, these are all different things that where we can improve the best practices of how we can characterize these cells, which not only is important mm -hmm. from the perspective of, you know, basic research, but you think about many of the things we're talking about all have clinical applications because um, for a lot of people, the name of the game is how can you improve somebody's life? How, how can you improve clinical research through regenerative medicine? All these big things we've talked about over the last 20 years. And we're, I think, right at the precipice of actually realizing that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we touched on some talks here this, uh, the past, uh, this is just day three right now, and there's more stuff to come. So yeah, uh, those have been really fantastic talks. Yeah. Hi, my name is uh, Wayne Poon. I'm the head of neuroscience at New Site. Uh, you know, s some of the most uh, memorable research I've seen is from uh, uh, Bruna Paulson, who is uh, working in, in Paula Arlotta's lab um, over in Boston. 
and she has some very uh, uh, important findings on uh, neurodevelopmental uh, uh, mutations uh, that cause autism. And so she's been able to uh, find a convergence of a phenotype on uh, chromatin remodeling and, and GABAergic dysfunction. My name is uh, Yofi Weil. Okay, I think personally, the 4D bioprinting talk um, mm. uh, by Darcy, uh, Dr. Darcy, Wagner. Dr. Darcy, Wagner, Darcy Wagner, yeah, yeah it was fascinating. Um, I have like had aspirations to do bioprinting for quite a long time. And I actually have access to uh, a bioprinter in my new lab. So just kind of hearing the stuff that she's tried that's failed and the stuff that's actually succeeded has been really illuminating. And I feel like I can draw on those experiences uh, specifically, like she's using this um, hybrid uh, model where she's putting decellularized ECM into alginate. That's definitely something I'm going to try with, uh, with lung organoids moving forward. Definitely some great responses. Personally, my favorite session, well, there were a couple. I'd say the Lorenz uh, uh, ISSCR award session was really great for me. All the speakers were great, but highlighted, of course, by Lorenz himself who you know, was forward thinking as usual, didn't reflect too much except for some inspirational words. If you can catch that online still, I would advise it because it was a really great session and also exciting just to see what he's got in the bag moving forward and to recognize his tremendous scope of his achievement. You know, More than 50 cells, he differentiated de novo from iPS cells. So he's had a huge impact in the field. On the, on the younger end of things, uh, my favorite talk was from Yuchuan Miao from Olivier Portier's lab, who had this amazing presentation of segmentoids, somitoids, great imaging, great, I think, uh, conceptual uh, illustration of just the, the power of uh, these stem cell models. And I think a real sign of things to come. I think we're going to see a lot of modeling of uh, human development using organoids. And, and it was one of the great promises of ES cells that maybe got lost uh, in, in all the therapeutic uh, hype and promise. But, you know, the, the real potential that drew me to ES cells was their ability to, to really visualize the, the processes that make up human embryogenesis. Uh, Arun, what about you? What were your favorite sessions? Yeah, there are a few different things that really caught my attention. First, when it comes to the basic side of things, there was a breakout session, I believe Saturday morning on the last day of the last major day of the conference that was focused on um, basically immune models and infection models using pluripotent stem cells. This is something that I've worked on a bit over the last few years during the pandemic. And it was actually one of my favorite talks was from Kyle Lowe at Stanford, who basically was looking at a BSL-4 level infection model of Nipah virus on purified pluripotent stem cell derived vascular cells, arterial cells, and venous cells. And he was able to show in that unique model that it's only it's preferentially the arterial cells that are getting infected by this really severe virus. I mean, just, just to think about it, a lot of these really scary, dangerous viruses haven't been studied for obvious reasons. They're, they're BSL level four, they're hard to get your hands on. And in this case, Nipah virus has a 60% fatality rate. So props to Kyle and his collaborators for actually giving this little, you know, scary area of study a shot and getting some pretty cool in vitro results from, uh, from this particular analysis. So that was one of the basic science sessions and talks that I was really excited about. Of course, as a space biology guy, it was always very exciting to see a space biology talk at the conference. Um, basically, there was a, a talk during one of the sessions on organoids and spheroids. It was basically sending pluripotent stem cell derived cortical organoids to the International Space Station. They were showing for the first time, first time, some of the results that they had um, that, you know, from these cells that came back, i had never seen those results before. So just for personal interest, that was very exciting to me. And of course the clinical side of things, plenary number seven was very exciting showing the vertex clinical trial results. We had already received a hint of it from that New York times article that dropped late last year, but it was finally good to see the confirmation in the clinical results of that one patient after receiving the pluripotent stem cell derived beta graft had a huge improvement in type one diabetes, uh, restored insulin production, restored glu glucose homeostasis, a really beautiful result there. And I can't wait to see what's gonna happen with the, the rest of that particular trial.
Yeah, that one and a lot of other clinical translational tri uh, trials were really exciting to some of the delegates. We talked a lot about that with them. Uh, and we got some more conversations with delegates in just a minute. But before we get to that, you might have heard about the tremendous advances being made in cell therapy research at ISSCR 2022. If you need help translating your research to the clinic, the services for cell therapy team at Stem Cell Technologies can support you. Visit stemcell.com slash SCT to get in touch. Getting back to it, a topic we often explore on the podcast with our guests is the challenges they face in their research. So we wanted to hear from ISSCR meeting attendees about the biggest challenges facing the stem cell research field. Here's what they had to say. Hi, my name is Chloe. I think, I think really uh, maybe taking a step back outside of the scientific community is to see how the general public is welcoming the um, basically the use of stem cells and um, to, to basically uh, get across further than the scientific community and have the general public understand. I think stem cell therapies is a very scary topic. If you would, you know, I go home and I tell my family what I do for a living and I'm like, what? And so I think there is really a lot to do to educate and um, pass the message along of what we're doing and um, yeah, get the general public to understand that we're building therapies for the futures for many, many diseases and just has other therapies, maybe, you know, 50 years ago were really scary. Now stem cell therapies are scary in their own way. And I think we have a lot of work to uh, continue to explain uh, to the general public and educate, which I very strongly believe that education is the strongest and the, moon, the strongest driver in uh, the future of science. So uh, to me, that would be... Uh, the biggest challenge. Hi, my name is Davila Arleti. Um, besides the idea of like public perception, that is a thing Sean Morrison was talking about this when he got his award yesterday. Uh, but we also have the problem of scalability. So now we've reached a point that we have lots of reproducible protocols, but how we can get a small protocol that works really well in the lab and scale it up like to work with instead of five cell lines, like maybe 100 cell lines, 200 cell lines, and use these for applications for like broader population bases. So when you're talking about using stem cells to model cancer, to model cardiac diseases, understanding like small variations in a person, awesome. But sometimes you have to understand the variations among populations. Mm -hmm. And for these, you need something else. You need new tools. Maybe you need like bioreactors, you need cheaper media, you need like more reproducible protocols. That is an interesting thing. And it's a challenge that some people are trying to address, uh, but I think it's still underexplored. Hi, I'm Debbie. My view might be a little biased because I'm in the 3D printing field. I think that the organ engineering field is at a point where we can really think about growing large scale organs. And that's because in the past, five years, there's been a lot of breakthrough in the printing field to go in and vascularize and customize um, the, the blood vessel networks in these large tissues. So really, the thing that's holding the field back is how can we grow tons and tons of cells on a regular basis to keep having these weekly printing experiments and troubleshoot all the little technical things to figure out the engineering behind 3D printing organs. So that's what I'm truly passionate about. And I can see actually, um, the research here and the posters, there's so many more people doing large-scale bioreactor work compared to, I think, like even a few years ago. So you can feel that the field as a whole is starting to progress into that step. My name is Emily Ballard. I think it's the fact that it's kind of on the cusp of transitioning from just abstract research to actual therapy in the clinic, really, and kind of needing to really go past all those ethical constraints and the regulatory issues and really clean it up, tighten it up and make it safe for patients. Um, just in the exhibit hall just now, I was seeing all these closed system um, culture systems for stem cell culture. And I was wondering why is that necessary? Well, it just seems like just being in a cell culture hood with gloves on isn't enough. If you mm -hmm. want to actually put this in a patient's body, mm -hmm. you need to just have it utmost perfect culture and make sure they're not going to differentiate into anything weird in the patient. Hi, I'm Lauren Jennings. Uh, in my opinion, I think it's synthesizing all the stuff that we've learned. We have people using so many different techniques to try and make different cell types for uh, the treatment of different therapies. And I think there's 
really cool things we can learn from all the unique approaches and trying to see what the pros and cons of all of them are and coming together as a as a field and collaborating with you know other researchers and companies and really you know putting all these efforts together to translate to patients I think is a challenge and we have as much data as we have now but I think that it's well worth the effort. Hi guys, my name's Liam Taylor. Yeah, I think that's that's a really, really good question. Um, yeah, for me, it really comes down to enabling this technology and this innovation to be broadly adopted. You know, this market can continue to grow. There is already amazing innovation and technology. And if you go back two years, three years ago, a lot of that didn't exist. It exists now. You know, the conversations that we're having with, with customers and peers here, I think it has to be focused on bringing the cost of the, that, that science down mm -hmm. so that it can be used and adopted far more readily and equally the quality and consistency of that offering. You know, so it's great to get the science to work in, in an academic field, but taking that and rolling that into a commercial application that's affordable and therefore increases adoption and utilization, which ultimately grows the market and leads to great outcomes for people. You know, mm -hmm. That's the end of it. That's that altruistic view of the of the market. That's certainly what gets me out of bed every day. I'm Kiwi Florido. I think for me, um, I mean, for everyone, like we realize that there's a lot of potential um, from, you know, for our discoveries within the lab and like bringing them into industry, bringing them into patients. I think, you know, in the industry side within the stem cell field, the biggest challenge that I foresee is really getting that final push for cell therapies to actually be in patients. And because of the vast amount of companies that are actually in the pipeline, trying to get every single gene therapy, every single cell therapy, hypoimmune cell types, right? Um, it's kind of become a race rather than like a cohesive goal for the entire community to actually get this into patients. So I think that's a huge hurdle, um, you know, working together, trying to fast track things forward, right? I think that's something that we need to work on as a community. My name's Peter Dang. You know, um, I think when we think about cell gene therapy, and I'm, I'm going a little bit off and I'm going to try to tie it back to this, but, you know, really building a lot of trust within the public and like letting them, you should really talk to a lot of the experts and understand there's been a lot of research going into this, um, you know, generating the best possible, well-characterized, in this case, cell product. Um, you know, I think there's been something like 80 different clinical trials that have gone forward utilizing iPSCs and still to date, nothing's been really approved for therapies, but so I think there's still like a hurdle of how we can better understand what are the best things that, how can we prime these cells in a way that they are going to be the right therapeutic for whatever diseases that they're being designed for. So I think that's still a big challenge that hopefully as we learn more, again, maybe through AI and other things like that, um, we can better understand what makes the best product. And also from that perspective, even beyond just the cell itself, understanding, you know, are these, there are critical windows that are appropriate to treat patients. And I think that as we understand and think beyond these sort of traditional dogmatic parameters of how we treat patients, like maybe some of these things could be first in line, um, not just stem cells, but just therapeutics in general, and how we basically understand how to treat that, um, you know, maybe if we can get past that barrier, we can really make a big difference. Yeah. Hi, my name is uh, Wayne Poon. Um, I think uh, uh, the biggest challenge at least in the context of uh, you know my background, which is, is neuroscience, is um, being able to uh, I get a cell therapeutic uh, a product uh, you know into the brain still. So we're still uh, it's in its infancy and and we're, we're making progress. But I think you know we need more to be done in the area. My name is uh, Yofi Weil. Yeah, that's tough. I feel like um, when I first got into the field, um, you know, as an undergraduate, I was doing a tissue regeneration work uh, with Dr. Max Amplicus at UC Irvine. And I thought that we were just going to make stem cells in a dish and just toss them into people and it was going to be, you know, all good and dandy. But I feel like we're kind of not even that close yet to having transplantable stem cell derived products. And so I think like making an off the shelf equitable product that people can afford and kind of democrat, democrat, uh, democratizing a therapy is going to be the biggest challenge because you see it in um, kind of the FDA approved gene therapies. They're, you know, millions of dollars and the copay is up to $100,000. And frankly, that's just not really affordable. So kind of making 
uh, scalable approaches that everyone can afford, uh, I think is going to be probably the biggest challenge uh, in the future. Some not too surprising comments in there. I've heard a little bit of that before, but personally, I, I would like to agree with some of the the comments that mentioned that translation is really the the big challenge right now. I think there's that quote unquote valley of death that we've all heard of when it comes to FDA approval and clinical translation. And I think that's holding true in the stem cell field too. We've had amazing basic science, especially when it comes to the derivation of custom pluripotent stem cell derived cell types for downstream clinical applications, but actually bringing them into the patient and showing efficacy, that's tough. That's really tough. It takes rigorous clinical trials to, to make that happen. And I think there are certain technologies that may facilitate that further. We heard a lot about these hypoimmune cells, these immune shielding approaches that may be able to protect some of these cells once they are transplanted into people. So yeah, I think translation and effic, you know, efficient integration of pluripotent stem cell derived products into people for clinical trials. I think that's really the big challenge right now. Agree with that 100%, Arun. The last question we wanted to pose to research is that 2022 ISSCR annual meeting was how have the last two years changed research and are there aspects that have maybe changed for the better? Let's hear what some researchers had to say. Hi, my name is Chloe. I think to me, what was most negatively impacted by the pandemic over the last years is creativity, mm. uh, at least the way life in the lab was for, uh, for me uh, back in Boston was really uh, coming to lab in shifts. You know, you had a mm -hmm. schedule and you, okay, I have four hours now, I'm going to do that experiment and then uh, I can't be here anymore for density. And then you're just, you become, you lose your creativity because you're on a schedule. And then what if it doesn't work? Well, sorry, you got to go home now. You can't just, so I think those, um, those, this lack of basically freedom for quite some time as I think, uh, kind of impacted my creativity. And I think this is why also maybe that should have been my first answer to the first question is that now being back here doing normal things, if we can say that again with the community, a uh, scientific community sparks that creativity again. So I think I lost that a lot, but I think it also uh, trying to see the positive. I think it helps when we couldn't go to the lab for so long, yeah. seeing that, you know, there's other things in the inside of the lab. So I think, and there's also a lot of things that one can do when not running around. Uh, for many, many hours in the lab, we can also sit down for longer times mm -hmm. looking at the data and also, you know, reading right. different things and expanding mm -hmm. our horizons. So I think I literally during the lockdown found myself like, okay, now what? And actually in the now what, there's also many things that one can do both mm -hmm. in that kind of work, but also outside of work. So I think a little bit more of peace and inner peace and inner quiet to kind of open up horizons, I guess, or at least I try to do that. Hi, my name is Davila Orleti. Yeah, for us, it was an interesting thing because it uh, helped create some priorities for some people. Uh, in the lab, what we developed was like, some people decided we need to stay home to stay with families and others decided, no, I can still keep on doing research, but it was more def defined timeline. So I was like, I need to go to the lab in a more specific schedule because I have something else also to look for. So creating a better balance for these. And sometimes also thinking about a little bit outside the box of what your lab was doing. So for example, we saw Todd McDavid's lab collaborating with Melaine Ott for studying like how uh, COVID was affecting heart cells. That was a thing that was like a heart biology person working with a virologist mm -hmm. to study a new uh, phenomena. Or in the case of our lab, we decided to make a new basal media that was something that has been underexplored for the past like 50 years. Mm -hmm. So we had components that were developing in the 1950s, 1960s, and we used a time that COVID gave us because some people were not in the lab and we could use the cell culture space to tackle a problem that we saw that was important. Uh, but couldn't be addressed with the just day-to-day -day activities. So we're like, okay, we can free up our minds from like some of the grants and some of the conferences that were not happening, focus on these small problems. It's, it's not a small, but it's a problem uh, that could help us build the next step of the things that we would be doing. Mm -hmm. So help create a better balance, help change priorities, foster different collaborations, and gave us time to tackle problems that we saw that were happening that were underexplored. So I think toward like those four points uh, that were interesting that the pandemic gave us it can be the silver lining of the pandemic, I would say, uh, but missing people and like not seeing each other, I think still has a toll uh, that undercounted. Hi, I'm Debbie. I guess I'll have to say the pandemic has had the largest change and 
for the better, I would say now that we're being hit by a lot of these supply chain issues, I think it's starting to challenge us as a field to think about how can we use make science sustainable? How can we use the few resources that we have or to have the largest impact? So I guess I go back to Christine Mamrie's talk, um, just thinking about how you can use just 5,000 cells per tissue and ask so many questions in a high throughput manner. Um, and it's sort of these simplifying a process can be a very elegant and beautiful way to solve a lot of the problems that we have. My name is Emily Baller. I think at the beginning of COVID, it gave everyone kind of a pause to really just think about and reconsider what they want to do when they get back into the lab. And then as COVID progressed, everyone continued their research, but uh, all the virtual meetings and Zoom calls and, and everything really helped kind of globalize the field a little more. Because I remember previous virtual ISSCR as I'd be sitting up practically in the middle of the night to look at some talk that was going on in Europe or just somewhere around the world. And we've had so many Zoom meetings with collaborators since this has happened and gained new collaborations. So. It's really globalized things. My name is Ishita Jain. I think it has been both positive and negative. Um, I think when we when it started, there were so many online series that came about, and I could like just from my bedroom see such um, phenomenal researchers give talks, like issue talks by um, uh, um, Dr. Gordana and so many others. I think that's the part that I really like. The hybrid conferences, um, loved it. Things have been hard though. Um, the constant backlogs, you don't know when a uh, reagent's gonna be back ordered for months. So that has definitely slowed down research. But on the other hand, I think it has also um, forced us to, I don't know, plan better, find uh, alternate sources, which I don't think is a bad thing necessarily, but yeah. Hi, I'm Nazia Rasiwala. I think um, collaboration is a big positive change and communication. And I think people are more open to connecting virtually, which really helps bring people all over the world together. We don't have to meet once a year um, in San Francisco. We can kind of connect over Zoom whenever we need to. And I think people are a lot more open to sharing ideas um, virtually. So yeah, I think that's kind of a good thing that's come out of the pandemic. My name's Liam Taylor. It's been really difficult yeah. to, to get things done. Uh, certainly in the UK anyway, that's where, where we're based. Um, not only have we had the pandemic, we've had Brexit, yep. um, mm -hmm. just to complicate things. But certainly as a CEO, in all my years, this has been the most challenging years. And I think it's more about the people. And I think we've seen um, the impact on the person, you know, the scientist or the commercial individual dealing with that I .e. isolation and still trying to create an environment where people are connected and still innovating. Mm -hmm. um, we've had to really be creative i suppose in how we get that to happen and make sure that we tap people in that are out working from home mm -hmm. you know our lab we were a critical supplier so we we're able to open up our business but even then you know in that stress condition that's certainly been the biggest challenge that that we've faced in our business and i think that's a fair a fair point to around the market as well i think the other one is supply chain yeah you know that is biting everywhere everything from plastics to a, a critical reagent, something that you didn't see coming. Mm -hmm. uh, and suddenly you're, you know, you're, you're constrained. That, with that constraint though, comes innovation. So people, you look for off other opportunities to remove those constraints from your, from your service or from your application or from your technology offering. I'm Kiwi Florido. I think the last two years while I was on Zoom, um, the best thing about it was more inclusivity for the entire scientific enterprise, the entire community as a whole. People or universities that could not have gotten certain types of speakers before have been able to connect with them 
more easily, more readily because of Zoom. Um, with just one click, you know, you're with a Nobel laureate having a chat um, and whatnot. And it wasn't only Harvard graduate students who had access to these or top tier universities. Um, you know, so there was more inclusivity, more diversity into the number of people that we actually were able to interact with, which was amazing. Different time zones, different institutions, different types of science. Um, one talk after the other, which I think was was really great for the for the community. What Another thing that has changed, I think we become a little more distant from each other in a sense within certain labs, within certain institutions, like certain things that we all used to do together, you know, have coffee after lunch immediately. Yeah. We may not know, you know, we may no longer do or are no longer comfortable doing with, which is totally understandable. Like the pandemic's still out there, COVID's still out there, right? Um, some of us might not even be able to afford time off from the lab. Right. So these are things that are running through our minds. We're always anxious these days to be around other people. Um, so in a way, I hope like we're starting to come back and, you know, really try to reintegrate into society, get more comfortable being in the lab every day, doing actual bench work, um, you know, TC work um, with other people. My name's Peter Dang. Man, um, a lot has happened over the last couple of years, but I think that Again, I think some aspect of things being virtual has made accessibility really, really available for people. I'm able to contact researchers from the world over. I'm used to waking up, you know, at 6 a.m. to talk to the teams out in Europe. Um, and I think that as we m improve accessibility, democratize a lot of this research and better understand and share this information with one another that we're moving forward. And I think like the, the aspect of really utilizing virtual conferences and other things just improves how we can speak with one another about advances within the field. I think science in general has always been pretty good about that, like sharing data with one another. Um, but, you know, I think that was almost from the perspective of that was a choice that you had to do. And with the last couple of years with the pandemic, you had to do that. And I think that really opened a lot of people's eyes and like, yeah, we can, we can still be very collaborative without actually seeing each other in person and doing these sort of hybrid style meetings, I think just improves, um, improves the accessibility for people to talk about research. Yeah. Hi, my name is uh, Wayne Poon. I think, uh, you know, here at the uh, ISSCR, uh, you know, we are a, a hybrid model and I think uh, in, in the future, I think, they're going to keep the hybrid model um, where you have the flexibility of attending in person. And I like the fact that there are certain uh, uh, presentations or, or sessions that are, you know, catered to you being here in person. And then of course there are then the sessions that are, that you can see virtually as well so that you can, you know, still attend if you're busy, but you can, you know, just log in and then, you know, check out the progress of, of, of the field. My name is uh, Yofi Weil. Yeah, sometimes I feel like um, in the new hybrid format, I can be like Hermione from Harry Potter with the time turner, where <laughs> I can uh, open up a laptop or two. I know I shouldn't do this sometimes, but I can kind of be in two places at once. And I feel like, you know, on a serious note, it has in some ways increased productivity, where um, I'm working right now at the UC Davis Medical Center, and I would have to drive back and forth between Davis to Sacramento with traffic. It's 45 minutes. I can just hop onto a Zoom meeting and just kind of have more time for my research, really. So I can get in that uh, most of my classes have that hybrid format uh, to date, even with, um, you know, some of the restrictions easing up a bit. I feel like we still benefit from this virtual format. I think that in some uh, places, you actually see productivity increase uh, with more remote on your own schedule uh, type of deal. Wow, some great points by researchers at the meeting. I was really blown away by just the fluency and the insight that they had to share. And I'm really excited just to, to see where these guys have to go. That's the best thing to me about these conferences, in particular the ISSCR. Something with the scope like this is that you really are seeing the next generation like in the making uh, while you're also, you know, reflecting on, on, on the old with some of the heroes of stem cell research and catching up with friends uh, from, you know, when you were coming up. So a great, a great time for me. I'm really looking forward to Boston next year and hoping I can get some in-between action, a room, maybe we'll link up for a conference. That brings us to the end of our ISSCR 2022 special. We had a great time at the meeting and hope that you enjoyed hearing from some of the attendees. Don't forget to check out the episodes that we released during the meeting. You can also reach out to us on Twitter 
at stem cell podcast or by email at info at stem cell podcast.com with feedback or to suggest guests. Thanks for listening.